So anyway, <laughs> but we're glad you're here this morning, and uh, we are continuing our series, The Miracle of Mercy. And if you paid attention to that clip, let me, let me just go back for you. <clears throat> he basically said, I, I hope people don't find out what our real flaws are. And I believe that the reason so many Christians are pretending they're someone they're not, are pretending they have it together, are this morning wearing a suit and walking into church and telling everybody everything's great as their marriage is falling apart and their life is being destroyed and they pretend, how's your day today? I'm blessed, aren't you blessed? And when they really want to say, my life stinks, well, that's another word they might use, but. So today we're going to talk about this idea of how much you matter to God. Because here's the deal. God is not in heaven going, boy, you are messed up. When you think of God looking at you. If you were to draw a picture of how God sees you, today as he looks at you, if he sat across from you right now, what would it look like? What, what expression would he make? Because if you feel like God is always disappointed with you or always frustrated with you or things aren't going well and so God doesn't love you as much today, then you will struggle in all of your relationships. You know, there's only two rules Jesus said, love God and love people. And how you picture God looking at you and how you picture how God thinks about you will change everything. Because when you realize that God absolutely adores you on your worst day, that he's not in heaven going, I'm going to withhold my love till you straighten up. I, I'm not going to give you what you need until you measure up. I'm going to, in heaven, go, oh. But he doesn't because he loves you. He adores you. It was funny, a, a, a few months ago, um, I was sitting at one of Ricky's basketball practices. And uh, there was a young lady sitting over to my left. And uh, she looked familiar, so it was one of those where you like recognize somebody, but you don't want them to think you're staring at them. You know what I'm saying? So that they don't go, you know. So I kind of, I'm like, that person looks familiar. So all of a sudden, she, at the end of the practice, she slides over towards me, says, hey, Mr. B. Now, you got to realize I have different names for different places. When I teach school, I'm Dr. Brookins. Hello, Dr. Brookins. Hello, students. Got an answer. No. Okay. So, and, um, you know, and, and, and people know me as Eric. I did a wedding yesterday with people that I worked with 24 years ago at Quincy's, home of the big fat yeast roll. Ever since I worked there, I've tried to mirror that image, apparently. So she says, hey, Mr. B. So I knew this is one of my students. My students who are now in their mid-30s. And she gave me her name, and as she gave me her name, suddenly fear overtook me as she said, I have to tell you something. Because I remember her in junior high, and this was her expression 90% of the time. Back when they wore wristwatches. watches. And so I thought, oh no, what am I about to hear? And, and I instantly kind of did the, mm, brace yourself. Here comes the, you ruined my life. <laughs> she said, you were the best teacher I ever had. The things you taught me and how you taught me to learn helped me all the way through college. Thank you so much for teaching me when I was in junior high. What? 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 Uh, what? 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 Because I was expecting you ruined my life. <laughs> and I, it's funny now because I didn't even recognize her, but now I see her around town. Hey, Mr. B. I'm like, oh, hey, you like me. Okay, good. Good to see you. Right? Isn't it funny how your perspective of how somebody thinks of you 
influences how you respond to them. And here's the deal about all of that. Some of you right now, because you grew up in a home where no matter what you did for your parents, it was never enough. Or if you didn't do something quite right, they shamed you and guilted you and told you what you did wrong. And they were on you all the time. Or maybe they withheld love from you when you didn't get everything right. And God does not do that. And when you and I begin to understand how much he loves us. Now, I will tell you, listen, this is what's funny. When I do a sermon on how much God loves you, every once in a while I get pushback. And here's what the pushback is. But Eric, don't you know in the Bible God also is a God of wrath? A God of justice and judgment? I mean, if you just tell people God loves them, then they're just going to sin. Paul actually addresses that. And it's the idea that when you and I really understand God's love for us, that instead of running from him, we run to him. So that when we fail and when we mess up, we run to him. And today we're going to look at Luke chapter 15. And Dr. Luke, as he's known, as he told this story, is, is retelling at the time that Jesus told three stories about three different Lost things or people. See, Luke was a Gentile, and so he understood the idea that some people would look at him and say, I'm Jewish, you're not. I'm important, you're not. And what's really cool is Paul, who was a Jew himself, wrote most of the New Testament, and he spent an entire book called Hebrews talking about how you and I have just as good of a relationship with God because of the sacrifice to Christ. Titus 3.5 says it this way. He saved us not because of the righteous things we had done. Time out. Some of you right now are thinking God loves you a little more because you made it to church today. And then you're thinking of somebody who didn't and you're like, mm-hmm. If that's your motivation for coming to church, can I tell you right now? That you're not going to enjoy coming to church. Because you're going to think, I'm earning God's love today. So I put my money in the bank. You know, I came came here. I gave a little money. I did a little something. I did a little something spiritual. I helped my neighbor. Listen, when you really understand God loves you because of his righteousness, not yours. You're not earning it. You're not trying to measure up. And then he continues, but because of his mercy. When somebody forgives you a huge debt. You're suddenly very grateful for them. When the dean of my high school looked at me and said, I don't have to let you graduate after what you've done this semester. And then he looked at me and said, but we're going to forget today ever happened. I still love him. I have a friend that doesn't like him as a teacher. She said he was a terrible teacher. I'm like, I graduated. Because when we understand God's mercy, it helps us to love him more. And when you love him more, if Mr. Green called me today, I would say, what do you need? 30 years ago, I graduated. What do you need? He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. This is the idea that you've been born again. He's changed your life from the inside out. And he continually washes you. And he cleans you. And he takes care of you. And you are continually being changed. In Luke 19.10, Jesus said this. I've come to seek and save those who are lost. I did one of my favorite types of weddings yesterday as I celebrated uh, this woman who I've known for half of my life now. There were other people that worked with me at Quincy's. And as I'm looking out among them, I'm thinking, a lot of these people don't go to church. God, would you help them to come home? In our church, one of our main principles is helping people come home to Christ. Because here's the deal. If we're just reaching church people, we don't need to have church. If we're just reaching people who already are saved and we're just trying to convince them that we're better than everybody else, we have missed the boat. Because here's the deal. I'm headed to heaven and I want to take as many people as I can with me. And I hope you're the same way. Last week as I sat in First Baptist Church with that congregation, I looked around and I said, one day we're all going to be sitting at the table together. That's an awesome thought. But I want to fill up heaven and empty hell because Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. So Jesus tells three stories about what it means to seek and to save. In Luke chapter 15, he talks about the lost sheep, 
the lost coin and the lost son. I'm not going to have time to go over each story really specifically, but I would encourage you to read all of Luke 15 later. I am going to summarize it. You need to know this, though, before I go any further. Lostness implies value. There's a guy who in, uh, in Titusville has a sticker that says, I don't need to be found. I'm not lost. And I want to say, you're more lost than you even know. Because when you're lost and arrogant, that's the worst kind of lost. Some of you are married to one of those people. Right? You know that they're lost and they continue to say to you, I know where I'm going. And you know that they don't, but they're not going to admit that they don't. And there's a lot of people like that. They like to pretend they know where they're going, but they're just drifting through life, seeking selfishness and self-centeredness. But when you're lost, I want you to know, you can only be lost if somebody cares where you are. Yes. Jesus cares where you are. You matter to him. You have value. So let's look at three, three things today. Number one, what do I lose when I'm spiritually lost? We're going to talk about this idea of a lost sheep. Jesus tells a story about a shepherd who had all of his sheep except one. And he left the 99 to go and find the one sheep. And a lot of us, when we hear that story, we imagine Jesus coming up to us and going, Where did you go? Where have you been? Get back in the pen, right? But listen to what he says in Isaiah 53, 6. We have all, oh, excuse me, I lose my direction. We have all wandered away like sheep. Each of us has gone his own way. Did you know most people are drifting through life? They drift through life with their time. They don't plan anything. They just go through. They work. They go home. They watch TV. They eat dinner. They go. They maybe have a favorite show. They DVR. And then they just get up and do the same thing the next day. Some people do that when it comes to money. They just go through life. And By the way, if you don't plan your life and you don't plan your money, guess what's going to happen? You won't have either. By the way, in February, we'll be doing Dave Ramsey, so there's a little plug there. All right. Number two, I lose. If you don't know what that is, it's financial planning. All right. Number two, I lose God's protection. Psalms 32, 7, you are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. Songs of deliverance. When you think about the shepherd, he wants you to be close. He wants to protect you. And most of us know someone who we look at and we're like, wow, you really need protection. You don't even realize. We see them wandering off, ruining their lives with alcohol or drugs or something else. But if we're not careful, the truth is we'll wander away. Now, if you're a Christian, the truth is, God, you are always home in Christ. But even as Christians, we have a tendency to wander off in the things that we do. Number two, we talk about a lost coin. It's a story about a woman who loses a coin, so what does she do? She sweeps the entire house. How many of you have ever lost your cell phone for any length of time? Anybody in here? If you've never lost your cell phone or you don't care about your cell phone, you are rare. Did you know they've actually said over a third of Americans have admitted to falling asleep with their cell phone in their hand. That's how much we hang on. I'm not talking about the dresser. They're falling asleep every night. A third. One out of three. So if you're not one of those, look at the people next to you. One of those people. Right? And, and here's what's funny. Here's what I think is funny, though. Because the people who don't do that right now are, have gotten arrogant. I would never do that, Eric. I can't believe that people think that their phones are so important. Well, the person who's done that is like, yeah, I use my phone for everything. I use my phone for everything. And the lost coin is the same idea. And when you lose something, it loses its potential. It doesn't lose its value, but it can't accomplish anything. First Corinthians 2.9, it says, And what no human mind has conceived the things God has prepared for those who love him. Here's what's interesting. So I gave this sermon last night talking about money. And I said, you know, if you lose $100, it's still worth $100. Yes. I used that illustration last night. This morning, somebody who was in church last night said they were at Walmart last night and found a $100 bill on the floor. Now, I'm telling you right now, somebody right now is going through their wallet going, uh-oh. But guess what? That money still has just as much value. And you, no matter where you are, if you're here today and you're not a Christian... You are just as valuable. 
If you're here and you're a Christian, you need to know that those people who haven't come to Christ yet are just as valuable as you are. We tend to think, well, I'm a little better, they're a little worse. No, no, no. We are valuable because God loves us. He gave his life for us. In Luke 15, it says, the, the lost son... Oh, am I there yet? Okay, like a lost son, I lose my identity. Now, this is probably the biggest point in the whole message, so, so listen up for just a minute. If you napped for a minute, tune back in. Here we go. So he went, the Bible says, talking about the prodigal son. All of you, I think, know the prodigal son's story. Basically, he says, Dad, I want my inheritance. He wanders off. He goes to another country. It says he lives wildly, loses everything. Finally gets to the point that he has nothing. And so here's the verse that picks up on that. So he went and forced himself on a citizen of that country who sent him into the fields to feed the pigs. He was so desperate that he didn't care that he was Jewish. He was so desperate he didn't care what his father said anymore. He was so desperate that he was willing to do anything to find satisfaction. And that's the truth. And some of you, if I asked you to tell your story of how you find, found Christ, you would say, I got desperate. I finally got to the point that I lost my identity. I didn't even know who I was anymore. My life was about things that didn't really matter. He forced himself. I want you to know that God wants you to be part of his family. He designed you to be that way, to live that way. And then the second thing, the second part of the, that part, number five, I lose my home in heaven. In Luke 9, 25, it says, what good is it for a man to gain the whole world if he loses his soul? Because of sin, you get to choose. So if one of you today leaves church and you want to go to an early brunch and eat 12, drink, uh, uh, what do they drink at brunch? Uh, uh, what's it called? Uh, Mimosas, yeah. And you go and you drink 12 mimosas and you drive drunk and kill somebody. God did not make you kill them, but he gave you the choice to choose. Love gives freedom. Let me give you a little tip for those of you who have been married for a long time. You already know this. And this is for those of you who are getting ready to get married. You're in love. You cannot make someone love you. You cannot force somebody to love you. You can't control them into loving you. You can't be like Bruce or Evan Almighty and go, love me. If you haven't seen that movie, you have no idea what I just did. It's okay. Yes. But you can't. And because of sin, we're allowed to hurt each other. But that's what love does. Love gives freedom. You have the freedom to love somebody. Love is scary because somebody can quit loving you. And yet God loved us. So you don't lose your value. Why? John 3.16 tells us. God so loved the world, or loved the world so much that he gave his one and only son. So whoever believes in him may not be lost, but have eternal life. So let me tell you how much you matter to God. Like a lost sheep, he rescues and rejoices with you. Luke 15, 5 says, and when he finds it, talking about the lost sheep, he yells at it and tells it, what did you do wandering off? And how dare you get away from me? And you've really lived a messed up life. And why did you do all those things? No. He finds it and he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. He takes the sheep home. He brings the sheep back. He doesn't say, now sheep, you've got to get these 12 things right. By the way, Jesus comparing us to sheep. Did you know sheep are dumb? Some of us just need to admit that. When you start to think you're smart, you need to realize, I, want, I can wander, but for the grace of God. And then it continues, back to that verse there, Judy. And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, let's all give that sheep a hard time for leaving. No. No. He says, rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. So let me give you a first picture of what this looks like. I love this picture. Too many of us think that God is yelling at us and pointing at us and telling us we're wrong. But Jesus told this story. This wasn't somebody else. This wasn't somebody who picked up on I think I know what God's like. Listen, God himself said I look for you. I pursue you. I leave everything else behind and I come after you. One. 
You know why Jesus said one? Because so many of us feel like, I'm not worth him coming after. No, no, no. The Bible says he would leave everybody and come after you. By the way, the Pharisees and Sadducees who are listening to this story did not like this story. Because they didn't feel like you were worthy to come home. And yet, what he does is he comes home. Like a lost coin, the Bible says. Number two, he values you even when you run from him. A lot of us think God only values me when I do what he wants me to do. No, he loves you. Now, listen, I know that sometimes God's heart breaks because we are running and hurting ourselves and hurting other people. But he loves you just as much. In Luke 15, it talks about the coin. When she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, let's yell at this coin for running off. Rejoice with me, she says. I found my lost coin. In the same way I tell you, there's rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. So here's what's really cool. We're in a church that reaches a lot of people who haven't been to church in years. And when they come home, I just imagine the party in heaven where the angel's going, Hey, <laughs> look at that one. They came home. It says there's rejoicing in heaven. They're partying as God brings them home. And I'm so excited over the years to have the opportunity to baptize, baptize hundreds of people who took that next step of faith. And I want you to realize that that neighbor that you think can never come to Christ, that God loves them just as much. One of the greatest stories I heard this week was about somebody who went back to a neighbor and made a relationship right that was strained. About a son this week that called his father and hadn't called him in months and months just to talk. That's what God does. He brings us home and he uses you to help people to come home. So if you're here today, I want to point this out finally. How do I connect with God's mercy? Some of you have been saved for years and you have forgotten how much God loves you and he cares about you. You've forgotten what it meant to be saved because you've been saved so long. Maybe it's been decades for you that you just take it for granted anymore. Let me tell you something. Pay attention to what God has done for you because it will make you grateful. And it will make you love people more that are around you. So that when I stand at a wedding yesterday with a lot of people who haven't been to church in years, I thank God, bring them home. You some crazy, goofy, dumb thing that I say to help them come home to you. It was funny, I was talking to a pastor this week and he said something about me being imperfect, which, you know, it's good. <laughs> I said, isn't it amazing? God used donkeys in the Bible, and he uses them every Sunday. And that pastor went, <laughs> yeah, me too. That's good. And I think most pastors know that. Some won't admit it. Some won't admit it. But I know some pastors, and there's worse words I've heard them call. All right, so. Some of you have done this, but you couldn't tell anybody else how to do it. So let, if somebody came to you today and said, Eric, I want to find my way home to Christ. I want to find my way home to Christ. Here's what I'd say. Number one, I get fed up with my life. You ever get fed up? You ever get tired of something? You ever get to the point where you're like, oh, that's enough. Some of you are like the election. Right? I had somebody say to me last night, Eric, why don't pastors talk about the election? You pray and vote. I just talked about the election. Number one, I get fed up with my life. Let me tell you something. God is not fed up with you, but you need to get fed up with you. It says he wasted all. He had nothing left. He got desperate and hungry. And then he finally came to his senses. Are you desperate enough to give your life to Christ? Jesus said it this way, Matthew 11. Come to me, all you who are tired and have heavy loads, and I will give you rest. Like Amazing Grace says, I once was lost, but now I'm found. Number two, I own up to my sin. The prodigal son, when he came to his senses, he said, I've sinned against God and against you. Have you gotten to the point that you've said, God, I can't live without you. God, on my own, I'm just, I just do whatever. I need you. And then number three, I offer up Myself. And I love this comparison. When the prodigal son left home and he asked for his inheritance, here's what he said. Give me. 
Give me. Can I tell you, one of the things we talk about in new members class is how easy it is to become selfish even as a Christian. Yes. And it's easy for people to begin to say, this is my whatever. This is my door. This is my microphone. This is my speaker. This is my chair. This is the place where I sit. I've actually heard stories about Christians who said to other Christians, you're sitting in my seat. Yes. It's easy to become selfish. But the truth is, before Christ, that's all you think about is you. After you're a Christian, you can fall into those old habits, but repent of those old habits and say, God, you've made me new. Help me live that way because here's what happens. After, he says, make me a servant. Make me a servant. Anytime that we think we're better than other people, we're in the wrong spot. And before we came to Christ, that's all we had was comparison and contrast because we thought we were in competition with everyone else. Once you're a Christian... You should quit thinking about how you're a little better than somebody else. You know a little better. You do a little better. You have a little better, whatever. So begin thinking, but for the grace of God. Thank you, Lord. Make me a servant. In 2 Corinthians, it says this. Anyone who connects to Christ becomes a new person. I could talk about this verse all day. You became a new person. You're a new creation in Christ. You're no longer a sinner. You've become a saint. You've been transferred. You've had an exchange. He has given you his righteousness for your sin. You came with rags and he wrapped his robe around you, gave you new sandals and a signet ring and said, you're part of the family. The past is forgotten. Everything becomes new. God has done it. He sent Christ to make him peace between himself and and us. And here's the Father's response. If you don't think of any other picture, I want you to think of this verse. Here's what it says. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was disgusted and said, what in the world were you doing running away? No. That's what we think. But it says, he saw him move with compassion for him. Today God is moved with compassion for you. If you're here and you're not a believer, God is moved with compassion for you. And when you say, God, I want to give you my life, he doesn't just say, well, I guess I'll let you. He runs at you. And the Bible says he ran and embraced him and kissed him. Welcome home. Now I want to show you one final picture. I love this idea. Here's the prodigal son coming home and he's broken. He's messed up. He's getting ready to give a speech. Father, I've sinned against God and against you. And the father doesn't even let him finish. And he runs at him and he welcomes him home. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, I want to encourage you, whether you're watching online or whether you're here today, to today surrender your life to him. Jesus, I'm messed up. I'm broken. I'm a failure on my own. I surrender my life to you. Thank you that you died on the cross to take my sins. And I give you my life. Yes. And he exchanges his righteousness for your garbage. He exchanges his righteousness for your sin. The picture you have in your mind of how God thinks about you will change your relationship with God. And it will change your relationship with other people. This week, as you're praying... This week, as you're going through life, ask God, first of all, God, help me to know how much you love me. Paul talked about growing in the wisdom and the grace of God to understand how much, how deep and wide is the love of Christ for you. God, would you help me to understand that? And then as you see other people, you know, those people you drive with, you know, those people in the office, you know, that person that you're praying for, kind of. But you don't think God can do it. Begin saying, God, I know you love them. Would you help them to come home? And Father, if you can use me in any way to help them come home, use me to help them come home. God, I am your servant. What do you want me to do? How can I serve this week? What do you want me to do? Thank you for the grace you've given me. If you're not a Christian today, you can come up to me after the service and give your life to Christ. Maybe you're here today and you've been a Christian for a long time, but the truth is you don't think about how God loves you, and maybe you don't think of others in the same way. So maybe it's time to ask God to change your perspective. To begin to realize how much he loves you. And he loves the people around you. I encourage you to do that today. Let's pray.
Father, thank you for this morning. I pray, Father, if there's anyone here who doesn't know you, that after the service they would surrender their life. Maybe right now they would just surrender their life to you. Maybe they're watching online. They would surrender their life to you and say, Jesus, I need you. And Father, I also pray as Christians, we forget the grace and the mercy you've given us. I pray that we, Father, would walk in your mercy and in your grace. We surrender all to you today. We thank you for all you've done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to have a time of giving now. You give what God's put on your heart. More importantly, say, God, thank you. Thank you today. Thanks for being here this morning.